Okay, hello everyone. Professor Fritz back again. So this week we're looking at uh, two writers, William Paley and Charles Darwin. I know you've heard of Charles Darwin. Pretty much everybody's heard of Darwin, but you probably mean you probably haven't heard of William Paley. So um, we're putting these two readings in relation to each other. So uh, to understand one, you need to know the other, and vice versa. So the topic today is uh, this week is special creation and evolution. Um, special creation is the idea that uh, when God made the world created each animal individually special he specially created that and that uh so in a sense special creation rejects any notions that there's such a thing as evolution so that's why i say it's it's an opposition and that's what we're looking at today with the or this week with these two readings so so i want to give you a heads up give you some tips on that understanding and to talk about what you're looking for and what you're what you should be prepared to encounter all right, first of all, you're going to start with William Paley's article, which is called Natural Theology. This article was published as part of a book in 1802, so it's pretty old. Um, Paley himself, William Paley was an English clergyman, so he was a minister. All right, he wasn't a priest like a Catholic, but he was a minister. Um, and this piece of writing is an example of what's called Christian apologetics. And it's not, Christians aren't apologizing here. What it means is it's uh, a kind of writing that defends Christianity against objections. So people put forward objections to Christianity and apologetics is a defense against those. It says, here's what you're saying, objectors, here's my defense, why you're wrong. So it's a whole uh, genre, lots of people write in it. And so Paley's article is an example of that, all right? And what he offers, it's what's called a teleological argument. And when you ask yourself, what is a teleological argument? And this is something you can look up yourself online. It's basically, um, it's an explanation for purpose. So for instance, um, let's say you were going to the mall. I said, why did you go to the mall? I asked your brother, why did he or she go to the mall? And they say, well, they wanted to go buy a new pair of shoes. So that's your purpose. That's a teleological explanation for why something happens. But we don't say, why is it raining? Because the clouds wanted to moisten the earth. That's putting mind where there is no mind. Right, so teleological arguments really require there be a mind that wants things, that has a purpose, just like you have a mind and you have a purpose. So what Paley is offering here, what he's giving us, is a teleological argument about God in the universe. All right, and here's what it is. So natural theology overall, his article is called Natural Theology, but there's an area of intellectual investigation called natural theology. Theology, by the way, is the study of uh, God and religion, right? And ideas about that. So natural theology is a search for proof of the existence of God by looking at nature, not through revelation. So normally, you know, for Christians, knowing God comes through revelation. It's been revealed to the prophets and, to, and Jesus has revealed it to people and it was written down in the Bible. So you read the Bible and that's how you know God because it's revealed in the book. But what uh, Paley and many people were doing in this period, we're looking at natural theology, the idea that there's something in the world, you can look at it and see proof of God's existence, right? And so I'll just say, as I wrote it here, in other words, the order of the universe is proof of God's existence and the beauty and harmony of the world is proof of his goodness. So you probably had this idea, you either thought it yourself or someone said it to you, right? The beauty of a sunset is proof of God and his goodness. If you look at a beautiful sunset, there's gotta be a God, look how beautiful that is. That's, that's a natural theological position. Right? That's, that's saying, look how beautiful the universe is. Look how well-ordered it is. It must be because there's a God. Right? That's what that's called. Theolo uh, teleological. It's a theological argument, and it's called natural theology. theology. Okay. So this is what you're looking at. I want to give you a very much of a warning. So Paley's view of God, when he writes about how he knows God exists in the world, it's really easy to understand, and it's super intuitive. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, of course. That's what you're going to say to yourself. Oh, yeah, of course. It's going to be really easy to understand. But the question is, is it really true? Or does it just seem true because it's easy to understand? So a lot of times when we're looking for something to be true or false, we often go with what's easy or hard. So we change it, right? I want to know if something's true. If I see, oh, that's hard, that's easy, I go with the easy one. And I'll think the easy thing is true. And that's really a mistake that human beings make. It's just a thing we do. That's a mistake, all right? I'll give you an example. Like, let's say you never read any books about this. So you look in the sky and you say, oh my gosh, look at the sun going around the earth. I mean, people thought that for a long time, right? It's very intuitively true. It's just so obvious. If you look in the sky, you can see the sun is moving. 
if the earth were moving, there'd be this wind blowing, you'd feel it rocking, you know, it can't be, the earth is just not moving. The sun is moving, it's intuitively true, it's really easy to see, but you know it's not true. Just because it's easy doesn't mean it's true, right? Turns out it was hard to figure out that the earth went around the sun, that the earth was moving and not the sun. That was hard, but they figured it out, okay? So keep this in mind if you read Paley. Now, that's Paley. Now, the next thing you're reading is a passage from a book called Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. Darwin's the guy who invented evolution. All right, so that book was published in 1859. So it's a good 40 some years after Paley's argument, all right? Darwin was a scientist, where Paley was a minister, a clergyman, Darwin is a scientist. He began his research in 1831, when he went on a trip on the ship called the Beagle that went to explore the Galapagos Islands, which are in the Pacific Ocean, just off of uh, Chile. It's off South America, right? In a very remote island. Now, before Darwin went on this trip, he was himself a very strong believer in natural theology. He was a guy who thought that was right. So, you know, many scientists were. And the reason they studied the universe, they studied the world, was to learn how God made the world. That was their motivation, right? So he takes Paley's argument very, very seriously. So you might ask yourself, what does it mean to take an argument very seriously? It means you don't blow it off. You don't treat it simply. You look really deeply in it and say, I'm taking this so seriously. I want to understand exactly what it means. So he took Paley very seriously. All right. So here's what I mean by, and here's what I mean by how he, he uh, sorry, um, took him seriously. Now imagine for a minute, that your phone is missing. And uh, you look everywhere, you look everywhere around your house and you can't find it. Then finally you look in like your sibling's room and you find it hidden away. Like he or she, your sibling, your brother, your sister have it locked up away. And you like, so you're like, hey, my sibling stole my phone. So you confront your sibling and you say, how did my phone get in your room? Your sister or your brother looks at it and you says, well, how should I know? Maybe the devil stole it and put it there and hid it there. So what's wrong with that explanation? The, you know right away that it's a lie. How do you know it's a lie? How do you know it's a lie, right? Because there are certain kinds of explanations that you'll accept more than others. So the devil stole it is a supernatural explanation. Think of how much you have to believe to think the devil did, did it. There is a natural explanation. Your sibling stole it. That's a lot easier to believe, isn't it? So there are two kinds of explanations, supernatural and natural explanations. Science just totally rejects supernatural explanations. It just doesn't accept them. It just doesn't think they're real, right? If you have a supernatural explanation, you're just not doing science, which is perfectly fine. But Darwin was a scientist, so he rejected supernatural explanations. But he started by believing in Dave Paley's argument, took it so seriously, that that's when he realized there was something wrong with it. All right, so like most scientists, Darwin rejects teleological explanations for causal explanations, right? He doesn't look for an explanation that's got a mind in it saying, oh, the purpose of the sun is to warm the, the, the clouds and bring us rain and make life flourish. That's a theological. He rejects all those kinds of explanations. So this is very important. Darwin, this reading, Darwin has convincingly shown that Paley was wrong. Paley is just easy to understand, but easy to understand is not the same as true. All right. So look, evolution. Only 32% of Americans accept the theory of evolution by natural processes. 68% of people reject it. They don't believe it. However, 87% of scientists think it. And biologists, the people who work with species and how life moves, 97% of biologists think it's true. Now keep in mind, those who work closest with life, biologists, mostly believe that evolution is true. People who don't know much about it don't really believe it. Take that for what it's worth. So, all right. So many researchers were on the verge of discovering the theory of evolution, but Darwin's book was the best, first best version. Darwin asked the question, what causes species to come into existence? He's not asking how did life begin? Because nobody knows how life began. Everybody's trying to figure that out. But at the time he's just asking, where do we get species? Okay, where do we get species? And he also relates to, or asked a related question to this. Why are the finch beaks different on each island? When he was in the Galapagos, they had all these upper islands and all the birds were different on each island. And he asked why. So there are some key concepts to understand. First of all, there's a guy named Malthus he talks about. Malthus has this idea of exponential growth versus arithmetic growth. You can look this up online. Basically, he keeps this idea that populations increase faster than their food supply. 
right? And so what happens when populations, when wolves reproduce faster than there are things to eat, what do they have to deal with, right? What happens? Keep that in mind, right? And the other thing he talks about you have to watch out for is variation, as in variations between members of the species, just like people. Some are tall, some are short, some have long arms, some have short arms, some have blue eyes, some have brown eyes. There's all these variations, right? Keep in mind that all species have these. Why does that matter? There's a thing he talks about called the struggle for existence. You want to make sure you understand that. There's a thing called natural selection. Compare it to breeder selection. You have breeders breed dogs, right? What's breeder selection? What's natural selection? And finally, he uses this idea called survival of the fittest. You should keep those terms in mind as you work your way through this book and do the quiz and do the writing. All right, there you go. Paleo and Darwin, best of luck to you.